Welcome to Science Thursday. This is the fourth time we try to do this call. This is, do you think it'll work this time? Yes. Oh, flip. We got a Paul. Paul. Hello? We hey. got Paul and Paul's audio. Wow. <laughs> I'm wait, we're waiting for Jordan still. And he said he dropped his phone and now the button is jammed. It's so... That sounds like a dog ate my homework excuse yeah, I've ever heard one. Yeah, it's getting more and more <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> First it was, it doesn't, it's just not working. Now it's like, I dropped it and it's caught in a mode where it's <laughs> impervious to anchor calls. <laughs> so I'm sending a message. So Paul, do you want to talk about science? I talked to you on um, Twitter and asked you if you wanted to be on the show and you didn't answer. So my, uh, Usually, if people don't answer, I just try calling. Yeah, and I think cool. maybe in the heat of the moment, you'll be like, you know what? I will answer this. That's what I did. I yeah. answered the yeah, call. I, I, just, I don't think I looked at Twitter today. Isn't it good? Doesn't it feel nice? It is kind of nice. Man, what a relief. <laughs> All right, let's see what everybody's mad about today. What? What did you do? Yeah, it's hard for me not to wake up and look at it because, you know, I mean, I know it's true. You kind of crave that sort of drama, you know? Mm, something you something going, deep inside. If you were going to leave America, where would you move? That's a good one. Oh, so Jordan says he's got to figure this out right now. It's randomly starting Siri and shit. Doesn't he have, uh, I guess most people don't have like 300 other phones just sitting around waiting. Yeah. He's trying to unjam it. Okay. I literally have LMK, like a when do you get it? That I have. We're going to start have... this show. Oh, okay. Wait, what did you want to say? I was just going to say I actually had to turn phones off so they don't all ring for Anchor at the same time. Well. Wow. Oh, shit. I got. I was trying to start my theme song. Hold on. Oh shit! No wait. <laughs> I didn't know it started like that. I thought science, 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 science Thursday. Science rules. All right. God, science does rule. Science rules. So I pulled together a bunch of articles this week. We've got. A lot of animal news, some space news, alien news, some tech stuff, like surveillance stuff, um, and, a, and a little bit of psychology and, and neuroscience. Um, any science news that you guys can think of that you encountered this week, like in your normal environment, just came across any? Um, I saw something about how like the way the carbon credits were working in the EU was basically they were just like giving a bunch of money to Chinese factories to like improve steel production <laughs> and mm -hmm. it was real it was real political and depressing so. but not that uh that does sound like what would <laughs> what would happen though um, yeah, we try to keep it, uh, yeah. <laughs> we try to keep it pause core on science Thursdays. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for bringing it. Yeah. <laughs> also, it just sounds like kind of complicated. We like to th keep it to things like, uh, dinosaurs couldn't stick out their tongues, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah as we all know, good science reporting is simple. It's easy to explain yeah. here. First of all, like just in that spirit. You might maybe came across this story this week. I saw it a few different times on my Twitter timeline. I thought it was funny, so I just thought we could talk about it. Flamingo that escaped a zoo in 2005 spotted in Texas. Did you hear about this fugitive bird? Wow, no. Whoa. <laughs> I, love the story. I love the story. Trying, no, it's, it's uh, like... Are, are flamingos migratory? I think so. What was the movie about the escape from jail, the really one everybody loves prison break no 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 the real prison where you dug the hole behind the poster oh shawshank redemption shawshank this is like a shawshank story shawshank this... flamingo <laughs> wow 
Wow. Um, so this bird, he escaped from the Kansas Zoo in 2005 with a friend, and he just showed up again. He has a tag on, so they know it's him. Uh, let me read a little bit of this. According to Scott Newland, the curator of the birds at Sedwick County Zoo, who spoke to the New York Times, these flamingos were already adults, and so clipping their wings, as they normally would with young birds, which have yet to develop sensation in the wing bones, seemed unethical. Instead, the zoo cut the birds' feathers, a procedure likened to getting a haircut, but one which the keepers would need to do often to prevent any escapes. However, in June 2005, Flamingo 492 and an accomplice tagged as number 347 made their escape from the zoo after staff left the time between clippings too long. <laughs> Wait, can I, can I one yeah. question real quick. Yeah. How do they know which one was the, the ringleader and which one was the <laughs> yeah. tag along? I guess it's like <laughs> if they, if they, <laughs> they just knew these birds. They just knew their personalities already. Yeah. I wonder. It's true. Good question. Cause I guess it's cause the one is still around. You feel like it's the leader it was stronger in some way. Look, oh, because, uh, 437 is thought to have died. Oh, um, Man, yeah, 492. Said, 492 is a fucking hard ass. I'll, this is this article is from the BBC. It's really it was real. I was LOLing at this article. Uh, although the pair initially stayed in the Wichita area, a month later on the Fourth of July, perhaps fittingly Independence Day, the two fled for good <laughs> after a bad thunderstorm. Uh, while thir- yeah, three forty seven is thought to have died. Flamingo four ninety two has reportedly be spotted, been spotted in the same area with a Caribbean flamingo companion. So there's a new, he's got a new bud. Ooh. But mm. I just think it's like, it's been since 2005. That's what? That's 13 years ago? Yeah. yeah it's been on the run for a while. The, I just imagine, like, um, what do you even think happened between him and the original bird? I feel like we're in, like, season five of this show. Yeah. Season one was, like, started in the, in the zoo. And the final up was, like, the escape. <laughs> the, original, the original bird got um, a movie... <laughs> quit, quit television maybe to the big screen I just think I would watch this show though wouldn't you absolutely prison, have prison break for flamingos 100 yeah. million percent just so like a fugitive ever, flamingo you guys ever watch zoo mm, no the one about having sex with horses no it's um like the animals rise up oh it's really good <laughs> No, it's like it's kind of like like a fringe. There's, you know, you got a crack team trying to figure out what's going on with these animals. And oh my god! <laughs> I love, I love, love that show. I didn't watch like later seasons. Obviously, it gets horribly. It just gets worse and worse as far as plot and characters. But the premise is just beautiful. Yeah, it sounds good. Um. Yeah, so let's root for that bird. It's a funny bird. It, you can look for pictures of it online. I mean, it, just because you know it's a criminal or like a fugitive, it like looks cooler for some reason. Like it looks, <laughs> he looks like a cool guy. Um, do you want to, I guess I should go to new, more animal news just to keep it in the animal oh, I see. Zone. I see pictures. Yeah, this, this, this flamingo does not give a single fuck. <laughs> Imagine with a leather jacket on, you know, and a cigarette. Absolutely. Like, he looks cool. His partner is cool too. They have a very, very cool color scheme. They still are pink, right? Yeah, one of them's like four ninety two is whiter. Yeah, and his new comp no three forty seven was pinker. And we're gonna picture of it's, them together. But I don't know how old those pictures are. But you know, like the fact that people love to spout about flamingos is like you know how like, they get their color right. <laughs> it's because they eat shrimp, and the shrimp are red. <laughs> It's like that's everybody's fact about flamingos, but it's like I thought, like how long does it take for the pink to fade? And they're when they're out there on their own, they're probably not getting shrimp. How long does it take for the pink to fade? Yeah, <laughs> we all we all felt it in our hearts. Um. So, so what's this new animal news? Yeah, animal. This is actually from like two weeks ago, and I forgot about it, but it's really good. Um. There's a new, there's a new, this, okay, so, like, the, 
to get fish from the ocean, you know, well, you know, the bends, right? You go down in the, you go yes. down with like, with uh breathing apparatuses on, you got to go slowly up or else your nitrogen bubbles get explode or something. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they said there's this one zone of the ocean, some 200 to 500 feet below the surface. It's the mesophotic zone. And they skip it because like people are like, they're either doing the easy shit, which is like the top of the ocean where you can just like easily get to, or you're going way deep down. You're like, we got to find out what's down there. And this is like the between zone. And it's like super unexplored for a lot of reasons. Like it's still hard to get to, you know, et cetera. So the scientists invented a device that helps fish make it out of the twilight zone alive, a portable decompression chamber that helps scientists protect fish from injury when they're brought to the ocean surface. So it's like, this jar that decompresses over the course of a couple of days where they can, they can catch a fish down there, bring it back up and then it'll survive. So it oh, so seems like an invention like, that I feel like should have been here already, but it's new. Like if they want to research a crazy fish, they've just yeah, been pulling up the surface and it just explodes. Yeah, exactly. They said that there's been bad. weird ways of doing it before, which they would like poke holes in their lungs with needles. I think it said. Like oh, that, great. That, yeah, scientists poke holes into the fish's swim bladders with need needles to solve the problem. Um, yeah, so they, de they developed transparent collection jars two feet long that fit into chambers small and simple enough for divers to carry and manipulate. Uh, it's really cool, too, because so they like they just don't know much about this zone. Like it's said, they've, it's been said that we know more about the moon than we do about the ocean. We we're kind of like. Yeah, it's it's really crazy. We don't know that much about the ocean because it's so hard to study. So, so one thing about science fiction that I sort of wish we would we would go for is like there's this entire chapter of of science fiction about like living underwater in the oceans, mm -hmm. and like Elon Musk and J Jeff Bezos, they don't they don't care about that. What's what's the deal with that? It's because it's there's I don't know because it's always been there. It's there's more potential. You, I guess we think we know what's down there, right? We're not, we're not expecting anything really surprising. Whereas space has so much potential, you know. Still seems pretty tight, though. Yeah, it is really tight. And they said they at the Monterey Bay Aquarium they brought these fish back from this special zone. Now in our exhibit, we have eight undescribed species of fish on the public floor that people can see that they'd have no opportunity to see anywhere else in the world. So it's kind oh, of cool. crazy, right? Like I want to go to that aquarium and see these rare fish unnamed. Like they're, that's, it's like, that's how unexplored the zone is. They just went down there, brought back a bunch of brand new stuff. Neat, right? I'm, that I'm is... with Evan where I, I, I feel bad because I love space stuff. And then I want to go to space, but I feel bad. Like we do have this whole frontier to explore. That yeah, it's probably easier to explore than space that we could. Yeah, it is easier, but it's good. still hard, right? I think the one of the hard things is like it's hard to do remote controlled stuff because water. It's hard to transmit wireless signals through the water. If, if yeah. I'm if I'm understanding yeah. that. Yeah, and so that's like one of the big challenges. So it's going to be cool if that problem gets felt, figured out. You know, we could send like. We can just have kids in their rooms just like poking around the bottom of the ocean with submarines, with remote controlled submarines. That sounds amazing. Boring stuff, right? Like crowdsourcing the just like general exploration. That'd be cool. What if there was a VR game that is really just you're just piloting a real like you're like time sharing a real submarine drone? Yeah, it's like wait, Ender's game? Except instead of oh, with war, it's with science. <laughs> Um, so that was pretty cool. I was I'm psyched about that. I'm almost like I want to go to that aquarium just to see these rare fish. Although they don't. Yeah, which which aquarium is it actually? I think it said the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Oh, cool. I believe. Yes. I don't know where that is, but I can find. I think it's in. I think it's in. Um, let me see. Monterey Bay. Is it in San Francisco? Yeah, yeah, you could you could theoretically in, do this. But. It's south of San Francisco. Yeah, it's cool. Um, speaking of space, should we transition to space news? Let's do it. There's a couple space things. Um, 
Space is full of dirty, toxic grease, scientists reveal. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this one was funny. Uh, This is from a report from The Guardian. I'm reading from here. Uh, Oh, dang, I didn't highlight any of this. Where is this? Uh, (laughs) uh, Anyway, yeah, there's a bunch of grease. (laughs) Um, Oh, yeah. It's... uh, it's it's like it's dirty as fuck. So if you're just driving a, a spaceship around there, you'd come back with a greasy ship. Um, like deep space or what, all, what, what all portion? space. Sorry, I, I usually highlight the key um, facts in here so I can read them back. But now I'm like skimming to find um, how it's a large fraction. I want to say they said it was like twenty five percent. Well, when like you say grease. <laughs> Twenty five percent of space is just pure grease. Just, <laughs> if I'm remembering that from yesterday, yeah, it was like a lot. But like, isn't grease like the primary thing in grease is oil? So like, what? Um, it's greasy carbon. Um, it says it. They said it smells like mothballs. <laughs> so okay. space. That's a, that's a very specific smell. Space smells like mothballs. Um. See now you're yeah you're really I'm actually pulling way more team sci-fi ocean than space. Yeah yeah space. <laughs> now it just sounds dirty and gross. Uh, I can see that like sooty. It's like a sooty, gross. Yeah, space. it's like there's dust and grease, and so like gunky grease, too. like gunky, dusty grease too. So it's not disgusting. Elon Musk, you're wrong. Okay okay wait until now. Here wait, I'll just read this paragraph. <laughs> Until now, there's been uncertainty over how much carbon is drifting between the stars. About half is expected to be found in its pure form. The rest is chemically bound with hydrogen in either a grease-like form known as aliphatic carbon or a gaseous version of naphthalene, the main chemical component of mothballs. So, yeah, it's pretty much just like hydrogen and carbon that is like sort of just in this like either grease or 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 dust and it smells like mothballs so here's what we know no moths in space (laughs) moth free zone it's too dusty ironically because moths are pretty dusty wait let me read this paragraph this is where i said the, the amount they found that there are about 100 greasy carbon atoms for every million hydrogen atoms accounting for a quarter and a half of the available carbon in the milky way does that make sense to you oh yeah so it's not like 25 percent of the volumetric space is space turd it's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but a quarter and a half what does that mean a quarter and a half of the atoms like you know so there's there could be tons of empty space between the atoms but like of all but the like atoms, but of everything yeah five percent of it is just grease out there gunk it's a lot of grease grease is swept away within our own solar system by oh the yeah solar, solar wind. wind yeah so it's actually not greasy right outside but, but the more you get outside the uh solar system you're gonna hit grease well, that's nice. I didn't know that there's so much uh, carbon out there, just like floating, yeah. floating out and, and nothing. Yeah, so that seems like a, a pretty quiet like discovery. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you, uh, you know, we're out there looking for carbon, and little do we know, there's just a bunch of space shit just hitting our satellites. I don't think it is hitting our satellites, though. It, like Paul said, I think it's like not that greasy outside of ours well i mean you know the ones the ones that have uh taken a little yeah trip. yeah yeah true they're just getting greasy as hell did the golden you think the record golden records getting all scuffed up by grease yeah <laughs> that's probably why they have it's but it's so funny though because like when they wasn't do you guys remember this news story this is so long ago but about uh the like there was this one telescope that got like a single speck of dust on the mirror array and they're like it's broken we can't use it anymore yeah yeah that was um that was the i don't remember i think it was was it the hubble yeah yeah and then they had to go up and like replace a big piece of it no i actually heard about this today 
and on a different science podcast and they this were was like a yeah long, there was like a, there was like a speck of ago. paint yeah well i don't know how long ago the hubble was but there's like a speck of paint on a tool or something and then their measurement for like the warping of this giant mirror was like a time they said a fraction of a human hair off and so that made the whole thing Boom. out of focus out of focus and they had to go yeah. up there and it took three more years for them to like they said like put a bunch of like adjustments on the other stuff to like make up for this warped mirror that's this, like slightly off so mirror. annoying that's so that's the most annoying thing ever. Can you imagine just being like the the like yeah. director of that operation at NASA and you're like, "Wow." I just knew, well, the thing is is like if I'm doing anything like that, I know the first time we fire it up there's going to be something wrong. They had to yeah. inspect it. I guess that's true. <laughs> I mean, they try not to, but like Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you just know it. But I think like Paul, like I remember the like speaking of that golden record and the edge of the universe or the edge of the um, solar system, there was like a radio lab or something where they like recorded the sound. Like, I think there's like an almost like you hit a wall at the edge of the solar system where the solar wind isn't protecting you anymore. I don't remember, but it's, there is like a point, there's almost like, it's not even like a fade from what I remember from this episode. Like there's a spot out there where you just like slam into a wall of like, okay, you're outside the solar system. Would you guys, would you guys, so there's, there's a episode of this anime called Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. And one of the ways they deal with one of the villains is he's so powerful. They can't, they can't really stop him. So they like paralyze him or like turn him into stone or something and just punch him out of the (laughs) gravitational field of the earth. So I'm wondering if you guys, would you accept immortality but you'd have to just like you just have to float through the universe forever. No, that would be so boring. Yeah, <laughs> Paul. Well, I've thought about it. The um, there's a Arthur C. Clarke short story called "The Wind from the Sun," and uh, you know it's been out for fifty years, so I'll spoil it for you. Sure, <laughs> but the sure. person ends up. <laughs> ends up on like a wrong they're just on like a you know doing like a space yacht race and they end up on a messed up trajectory and so they're just going to be drifting away from earth forever but they're going to die right Mm -hmm. but it's kind of like cast as sort of heroic because this person is going to go be the like the first person to like leave the solar system oh cool it's kind of exciting so i always thought like you know if someone just wanted to like make a rocket put my mortal body in it and then just shoot it out there like that's pretty exciting to me i know it's like kind of dumb and like doesn't really accomplish anything but still still pretty cool feat it is a pretty cool feat you know i what i in this anime context where he's like there's no ship you can't really really like re think like orient yourself what i would imagine in that situation is just like something super epic is going on behind you but you just literally can't you just can't turn around and look at it like a supernova is just happening you're like damn oh, dang sure wish i could see that maybe i get good at like meditation or something exactly be, you'd be so bored you go through like you did you watch westworld this season are you shooting hosts right now okay look i live in new york i get it <laughs> there is, is there like a, a, there's a game fireworks People shoot off fireworks year round in my neighborhood, but also there's like some sort of gang war, like one neighborhood over. And so I like see these notifications on my phone on the citizen about like gun battles. Oh, geez. And then like, and so every time I hear fireworks go off, it really freaks me out. Thankfully, I can like see them light up the sky right now, so I know they're for sure fireworks. Um, I have a so good. I have a good segue to that. Is fireworks related? Mm. There is a there's a, vol- there's a new volcano that just erupted in the Galapagos. Oh Jesus! Sierra Negra volcano eruption. Nobody got hurt or anything. Oh good. This oh, is one that this is one that erupts like every decade or so. Actually, like I think speaking of 2005, I think they said yeah. Last time it erupted is when the uh, is when 492 flamingo escaped. 
Oh damn! Wow, there's <laughs> wow, there's connecting points here. <laughs> <laughs> But what yeah. do you guys think about about like the the like Pacific Coast like breaking off along the fault line or like Yellowstone or the, like Yellowstone was what you, I was going to ask think, about. Do you think in our lifetime we're going to have some sort of American cataclysm? I know, right? They say it's any it's any moment. It's scary as heck. The yeah, the Yellowstone one. I watched this absolutely horrendous Discovery Channel like feature ad on it, and it was like. <laughs> if it goes at full force, the amount of ash it throws up into the atmosphere could cause a global cooling, setting off an apocalypse amongst developed civilizations. Yeah, that's what would happen. It's pretty scary. Why has there not been a video game that, like, does that? Where, what? Where you have to rebuild after a volcano? Yeah. It's because it's depressing. I don't know. No, dude. Every game at E3 this year was about apocalypse. Hmm. <laughs> it's definitely that the depressing angle is definitely not stopping people. I guess they're just trying to prepare I, us. Can I pitch you a reality TV show that I really want yes. to happen in the world? Mm-hmm. Okay, like four people. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me how many people. More than one person are put in like a dome, like, um, and they're completely shut off from the outside world. And they're give and <laughs> there's an Ethernet port on the side of the dome, and all the raw materials exist inside this dome to rebuild civilization such that they can build a computer, and get on the internet, and their goal is to get on the internet, or or even just like send like a message over TCP/IP, mm-hmm. like we're done, or some something, hello world, or whatever. If they can send a message over the ethernet cable adhering to the TCP IP protocol. And they have, they're given all the documentation, all the instructions, all the information. Mm-hmm. Could you, could you rebuild a computer? Oh my God. Paul. That'd be tough. I don't really know this. I know. I feel like I was born for this TV show. Oh, you think you could do it? Absolutely. Without question. Wow. Now that you say it. Especially yeah, you, if, you there, could. if there's documentation, then Yes. I feel like it'd be a nice like two or three week experience. Two or three weeks. Oh my oh, god! Oh dang! That's pretty confident. Yeah, it's like I mean, it took him forever to figure out like transistors, right? Well, he doesn't yeah, have like, to figure it out. He just has to figure out exactly. how to make it so out like of those how, materials. How, how much is there in manufacturing technique versus just like pure like invention? Oh, you're saying? Oh, they, oh, you're saying like literally there is like raw form silicon yes in a in a bucket yeah yeah no, yeah jesus christ <laughs> yeah that's why i thought you're you oh my lord was pretty ambitious i was like wow maybe i admire your confidence okay okay now i'm thinking like like maybe five years yeah like do you guys ever watch that primitive technology youtube channel yeah oh yeah man what a weird channel like making a making a router Oh Jesus! Out of, yeah, out out of like one bamboo one. and like mud, <laughs> fired in a kiln somehow. Oh my God! I know that there was that one guy who, this one artist dude who like used a big lens in the desert to make glass in a sand 3D printer. That's pretty neat. Whoa! Like he used a big Fresnel lens to like yeah just 3D print some sand. That's cool. Um, but Paul, I love this show. Please make it and put me in it. Okay. Um, let me see if I can segue from the dome. Let's see <laughs> here. Uh, no, I can't. Oh, jeez. Well, what did <laughs> I say? Uh, let's see. So, alien news. Some more aliens have been found. Uh, scientists find evidence of complex organic molecules from Enceladus. Enceladus? Is that how you say that one? You guys know this one? This planet? It's, um, it's, one, of, it's one of Saturn's moons. Enceladus? Is that how you say it? I have no idea. I think I've heard it said, said that way. Anyway, so 
Using mass spectrometry da data from NASA's Cassini spacecraft, scientists found that large carbon-rich organic molecules are ejected from cracks in the icy surface of Saturn's moon Enceladus. Scientists think that chemical reactions between the moon's rocky core and warm water from its subsurface ocean are linked to these complex molecules. So, that's not life, right? That's well, similar to okay. what they found on that's, Mars. My clickbait is that it's, yeah. But no, they said it's better than the Mars stuff. Um, <laughs> they said, like, that's, what, that's what they said. Anyway, I'll, re I'll read this. This is from Southwest Research Institute. I don't know. Anyway, they said, we are yet again blown away by Enceladus. Previously, <laughs> previously we don't, only identified the simplest organic molecules containing a few carbon atoms. But that was very, even that was very intriguing, said SWRI's Dr. Christopher Glein, a space chemist specializing in extraterrestrial chemical oceanography. He is a co-author of a paper in Nature outlining this discovery. Now we've found organic molecules with masses above 200 atomic mass units. That's over 10 times heavier than methane. With complex organic molecules emanating from its liquid water ocean, this moon is the only body besides the Earth known to simultaneously satisfy all the basic requirements for life as we know it. So it's a really dank zone to grow life. Wait, dank zone. <laughs> but but we just we just learned that there's a whole bunch of like carbon molecules uh, just in space. Just in space. So what yeah. makes it special? I mean, these are big, I'm fat, really, complex I'm ones. These are fat, I'm fatter. really happy. They're so massive. Yeah. So here's my question, guys. What if what the scientists think are good qualifications for life are, like, good to have? They're, like, best practices. But, like, what if life, like, sprung up on Earth because of, like, the vibes? Nah. Life's really common. I think – I don't think – I don't think uh, we had anything that cool. Oh, okay. I think I think like what we're what we are looking for when we say like good for life is like we have a narrow definition of life and so it's like almost like saying let me think of a good metaphor here. <laughs> like what are the good ingredients for food and the only food you like is spaghetti and so you're looking for like <laughs> you're just looking sauce, for tomatoes, pasta. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> And I think like our definition of life is just basically spaghetti. And so we're looking for, yeah, it's kind of a good metaphor. They, yeah. So like, yeah, we're looking for life as we know it. And I'm not sure if like life as we know it is the only life worth respecting or being like psyched about, but maybe they're right. I don't know. I'm not a fucking scientist. I'll, I will also say like, uh, how do I get that title of space chemist? I know. Right. <laughs> cool. Like, what was his title? <laughs> Specializing in extraterrestrial chemical oceanography. Wow. Yeah. Dang. So these came from the ocean, though. They're like, this was, that's why they think they're, they're so complex is because they think there's like hydrothermal vents down in the ocean and there's some sort of ecosystem down there that mm -hmm. was able to produce these. And then they, they're like geysers, too. I, and they, I the geysers were, shoot them I, out of the ocean. I only knew about Europa. I didn't know there were other moons in our solar system with oceans. Uh, yeah, I was also not aware of any other moons that are, like, geothermically active. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, Europa is the one I know, too. So, yeah, Encel Enceladus. I had heard it mentioned, but, yeah. we I think, like, a couple episodes ago, we were talking about the, the Mars aliens, and we were like, what? In the same article, they were like, oh, we also found this stuff on the moon. And, and I was like, what the fuck? Why didn't I hear about this? But this is, I guess, that same that same information, but they looked at it again and they were like, oh, dang, this is more this like, is cooler than we thought. It, 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 really bugs, it bugs me that the scientists could have just like made up a moon. And I, 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 I could go my whole life without knowing for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. What, they, like one edit to Wikipedia, a couple, couple news articles, and yeah. I'm convinced that there's yeah. another moon. <laughs> I think that you could maybe see these with a telescope, but maybe not. Have you guys ever like, have you guys ever had that impulse for like your, there's like a really cool moon 
and then you throw up your 28 millimeter iPhone. You're like, this is the incorrect tool for this. And you think about all the things you'd have to do to get like really great pictures of space of, stuff of our moon. Yeah, and you're like, never mind. This yeah. is so. Fun. Yeah, I bought a telescope recently because I was going out to Josh Tree, you know. Yeah. Going to the desert, vibing out, looking at the stars, looking at the Milky Way. I was so disappointed by how how weak the Milky Way was. Like I could barely see it. That's like over exaggerated in photography. But then also I got this telescope that to look at the moon and I thought I was gonna like see like a lot of the moon, like it was gonna be really in focus. It was only a little closer. I just can't yeah, believe good, how good telescopes are so expensive. Yeah. This one, okay, it was like a hundred bucks, so I wasn't expecting much. But I thought it was uh, I mean, going to be better look, than that. If you look at what's going on with the telescope area of B and H, you know, yeah. you'll find you'll find some shit. It's crazy because I feel like it's really cheap to get like a a a, a life changing microscope experience. You know, Ooh, like yeah. oh, that's such a good that's you, such a good point. You can get like a toy microscope microscope at like a a literal toy store and like look at microscopic life and it's amazing but it's hard to look at the moon for some reason yeah i mean it did look better like i could see more detail than i ever could but yeah but for like i feel like i should be able to spend two hundred dollars and have a fucking hd yeah uh movie experience it was cool did you guys have telescopes or i mean uh microscopes when you were little definitely microscope yeah, yeah. I mean, so did you have the kind? I had the one that looked like a little TV. It was like a sort of like projector type thing. Like I didn't. So look I had viewing. one. Of the... Yeah, you had one. And I also had the like regular kind. It was yeah, cool. The regular one. Do you guys ever look at your sperm? Ooh, no. Neither did but I. I. But also, I, was... I, I, I didn't I have it. If I knew that I could, I would. With it's... armed with that knowledge, I would do it. Man, that's such a good idea. <laughs> I don't know if he's. I, I mean, I'm not going to Google it, but I don't even know if if what well, were our were our home microscopes strong enough to see those. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. Do you guys just look at like pond water though? Is that what you guys looked at? Yeah, yeah. We had like I a was, little stream next door. Yeah. I just I remember I had like glass slides, and so I would just scrape just anything. Yeah, I don't me. remember what it was though. I just remember scraping. I I think I looked at blood a lot. Oh really? You know I was the really into thing? really into blood <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> Listen, it's a mystery, man. It's just this liquid, and it supposedly has all the shit in it, and you just had to take it on face value. You know, it's a big jump. But the best the best thing that you can get is our pre made slides. That that yeah. is a hell of a time. I just didn't see the adventure mm. in that. I was always getting my own hot water. <laughs> Listen, sometimes um, you got to but yeah. Speaking of pond water. <laughs> While we're doing this, I'm going to look up how much it would cost to get a telescope that can fucking see this shit. Let me I, see. I, I, just, I just really, I, I want us to colonize, obviously, the ocean and Mars. But I also want a, enough of a colony on the moon that you can just look up at night and just see the moon like you know like oh, how you, the features. Tight. You, you know how you can see cities from space because of the lights yeah. i just want to be able to see lights on the moon that'd be, be neat so inspiring let's see here Ooh. uh so here i got some tech tech news this this is kind of a weird thing it was i had to read it a lot to understand it completely but um so the title of this article is System Let's Public Cameras Send You Messages. And it's like this idea that like surveillance is bad, right? So we want all the cameras to tell you, send you a message when you're being like videoed and then like give you the option to like make make it get um, censored, like like blur your image in the in the in the shot you know what i mean to give you like so that there's still information that a person was moving through the shot but it can't tell it's you does that make sense honestly no i don't understand sounds really convoluted i mean it's really it's okay it's in futurity it's it's futurity a shit site 
I've never heard of that website. All right. <laughs> I've not. But also, but also, I sort of wasn't listening very hard because I just found a sixteen thousand dollar telescope that you can buy on B and H, and it's completely <laughs> cool. It's completely computer controlled. Like it's got a remote. It's got the whole shit. It's a uh, sixteen inch. It says sixteen inch Schmidt Cassegrain OTA with a three thousand two hundred and fifty one millimeter focal length. I don't but you can still means. look look through it with your own eyeball, right? I am like not I don't want to just take pictures because, like, there's plenty of good pictures I can look up on the internet. <laughs> yeah, fair. It fair. is different to see it with your own naked eye. You want those photons to directly hit your retinas? Yeah, exactly. You know, Plus, feel eyes, that. eyes are kind of HDR. That's yeah, true. they are. That's actually a, a super valid point. I can't wait for um, camera sensors to become as HDR as eyeballs. I know. Jesus Christ. It's taking longer than I thought it would, honestly. I, I had this theory when I was like, I don't know, digital cameras had been out for a little bit, but they were still pretty shitty. And it was like, if you could ever take a picture as good as what eyeballs could see, it'd be like the best photo. Yeah. Well, like I mean, first, arguably, it HDR would, it would photos be... can do it if you combine two different exposures i was actually just looking this up uh you need like so there's there's no i was like can you do can you make an hdr video like just can you do that oh, like, i've with tried to do great it. stuff oh god it's so annoying you, the only thing you can actually use right now is the gh5 apparently and even that's just sort of like a hack uh what's the but it is 10 do? it's well it's 10 bit um and they, they basically it's a combination of uh, ten bit and a you know logarithmic profile, mm-hmm. and so they just conform it to. It doesn't really like it doesn't you know what I mean. Like, Listen to what I did to my okay. for my hack, and this is crazy. It's like um, have you ever heard of what's it called? Like not Magic Lantern or Black Mat Black Magic? You know, yeah, like Black the, Magic BMCC. Yeah. Camera? No, yeah. like the hacked camera, the hacked cannon. Oh, stuff. the Magic Lantern, Magic yeah. Lantern. He, is that what? Oh, it's did called? you see every other frame? Dealing? Yeah, yeah. So it like strobes. Ooh. It strobes at one at a bright exposure, and then it s- quickly switches to a dark exposure, like really fast. And then you have to like in post, like combine those. <laughs> Use some way. APIs to like spit that out. Yeah. So you have to like I don't know. Then like switch up. Yeah. Like group the two exposures into separate um, blocks and then, yeah, stack them. It didn't turn out well, I'll tell you. Yeah, now. I was going to say, that sounds like something I would say no to if someone was I, like, can I pay you to do this? I'd be like, no. It was an experiment. I mean, I wanted to try it. <laughs> well, that's perfectly legit. But yeah, I don't know. You still, yeah. Point being, you still can't get an H- no. a camera to do anywhere even close to what the eye can do for dynamic range. It's just not um it's sort of dumb because like the surface area of like a full frame or medium format camera is actually bigger than the eye you know what i mean yeah so, like theoretically the like a7r with a, like 42 megapixels should be close but it's just it's just not it's yeah it's so, I'm sounds bummed. like god did a pretty good job i'm gonna i'm gonna say but it'll probably be like five, I mean, yeah. five, five more years though so here's here's something cool that I was gonna do a YouTube video about. It's in my like list of videos, video ideas. Um, but it is directly related to this, and I'm clearly not gonna do it. So I'll just spit it out now. Basically, there was a company that made this like slurry of different sized quantum dots. You can sort of make quantum dots. Basically, you grow quantum dots. So whatever size you want them, you sort of just stop the growth process and you know finish them coat them with something and so like different sizes react to different lights and so they made like a red size and a green size and a blue size and they just put this all in like a little chemical stew and then they coated you know basically a regular CMOS sensor with these quantum dots and instead of reading you know capturing photons uh like in that little channel that they have to flow down and then get sensed basically the quantum dots react to the light as it hits it, and then that creates an electrical charge, which is then read by the CMOS directly. Okay. And so, like, it's super dynamic range um, 
because they do have a pretty big variance of dot sizes. And uh, Apple acquired them. Whoa. So that's and the answer is quantum? Quantum dots. Do you think our eyes are quantum at all? What, what is a quantum dot? I know, good question. Uh, a quantum dot is literally just a little uh, clust- cluster of uh, stuff. It's not like an invisible particle or anything. It's literally just a bunch of shit that has some quantum effects. Like if you excite it, it will make a certain wavelength of light. Hmm. I don't know. So you can just make you can just make them. They can just be manufactured. You can make them at home. Actually, I've watched some YouTube videos. And so I, that's I used heard for sensing or for displaying. So those ones are for display. Yeah, I heard our um, our sense of smell smell is quantum. Maybe it does kind of freak me out that like you smell by stuff directly hitting your brain in some way. I yeah. don't know if I like that. They said that it's like this thing where like a di- all these different smells are like different molecule shapes, right? Like imagine it's like Tetris and when they go near your nose or something <laughs> into the zones that you know how like quant- the like the signature thing about quantum shit is like it's like always in a potential cloud, like it's in a cloud of possibilities of where it is. You know what I mean? It's not in any location. Mm-hmm. And so and it's it's at every location at once. And so this is why, I don't know, you can smell so fast or something is like, <laughs> it'll hit, it'll hit these like sensors and then it'll try like, it's almost like Tetris, like trying every single angle and then it fits. It's immediately, it immediately fits because it's, it was trying every single angle at once. It was like I mean? instants in, you popped into yeah. the Warcraft Yeah, it server. was like, it, it was like, what is it called when you like bash, like a, a, try to get a password by just like trying everyone really fast. Just brute force brute force. Yeah, it was basically like. That's that's what they're saying. That and they said that's how like some they there were recent discoveries in photosynthesis that were along those same lines. That the, what, the reason why it's so, um, I don't know, like one of one of the properties of it is quantum, but and it works that way. Huh. Pretty interesting, right? I know I, nothing uh, about quantum, and I hate the idea of Tetris pieces hitting my brain. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you're saying the best way to hack the brain is through smell? Whoa, maybe, but I don't know. What if wow, eyes? Are, what if, you're telling me like these quantum dots? I know this is really going off topic, but these quantum dots. I don't really. I'm not, I didn't read this article, but maybe I wonder if like the eyes are are somewhat um, use quantum properties too. You know, I wonder about Probably. the brain if the brain does too, because like I've heard there's some non-local. Um, stuff like things will be connected in two parts of the brain seemingly like not connected but are doing the same thing you know what i mean wait wait paul i want to tell you about this thing about this amazing article i'll send it to you later uh about how like brain cognition works they like basically have this algorithm i already told rondo but he yeah yeah no i read the article oh you did yeah it was like about like different like harmonics on the brain and how the brain is like yeah, they flattened it out and then like <laughs> did different harmonics on it and they yeah, like, so... matched up with like really like thing. I don't really actually remember all the details, but I remember the details. Let me but... let me just roll let me just roll through this really quickly. So they found an algorithm, Paul, that mm. accounts for the generation of spots on all these different animals. Like it's just a formula that like very closely matches it. And so they've sort of like used this formula to see if it applied and like worked on the folding patterns of the brain. And they were like, whoa, it totally does. And so that's how they flattened it out. And then once they ran MRI, you know, once they like displayed MRI loops on this pattern, um, they said that, you know, it has this sort of like resonant profile. And what they're sort of hypothesizing is, is that like there may be these like resonant harmonics that are sort of like standing waves. Like they, they use an example of like, if you put sand on a cello and then like ran it over it, it makes these, you know, you can see the little striations, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. you know, uh, Kind you, of. I, I don't know if you've ever I, seen those. Like when you put need- sand on something and run a frequency through it, it like makes a shape. Oh yeah. 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 So they're basically, that's what they're saying is it's like, you can track this or this, you know, they connected it to what happens with their research in LSD and how it sort of 
it brings that like resonant wave, the like music of the brain into chaos. It's cool. It's a good Dude. article. Okay. <laughs> this is bonkers. I, please send me this article. Okay. About, I don't know, like three months ago, I was high and I had this like crazy epiphany about brain, brain waves. Like, you know, like obviously I wasn't smart at the time, but I was really into this idea. That, like brain waves are, are, are something. So here's, here's what I wrote down. <laughs> Memories function like waves, not graphs. When you're telling a true story, you look inside yourself and see where the ripples take you because the memory ripples touch many other ripples at once, so there's a lot to think about. When you tell a lie, you enter empty brain space with fewer truth islands to splash into, so you have to imagine the true thing. Makes perfect sense to me. And then, like, later, I've, there's some, I've got, like, this librarians versus vampires thing which is interesting and then like <laughs> maybe intelligence really is wave interference yes we can combine these incoming signals into new meaning you've done it paul there's a <laughs> there's a compatibility of their data types to make the build up uponable <laughs> listen i mean that's honestly what you're describing right there is not terribly different from what this article yeah about. that is kind of what it's saying a bit because that's that's how we make like that's what music is it's just come like we're combining a bunch of very simple waves to make something that sounds like smells like teen spirit you mm-hmm. know but it's all just you could decompose it down to just like sine waves basically um, it's neat it's neat I, wanna... hope, I hope that they find out that we're just we're just music machines that'd be tight uh, i've got i've got such the article for this I know we. I ban. I'm gonna abandon the one about um, the surveillance cameras, but I think actually you guys would be interested in that. Um, but this, just because we're talking about neuroscience, there's an interesting article about what time feels like when you're improvising, the neurology of flow states, and I'll say like the science of flow. You know, being in flow, I'm like really skeptical about that idea because like people are just trying to like. It's like it's like about it's like people trying to maximize human potential and stuff, and I'm just like skeptical about like how you define what is like the best way to be a human and stuff like that. But anyway, like the new tropics guys that are just like this. Yeah, brain yeah. With guarana. But not that I don't think these are real, but I don't know. Anyway, this is an interesting article. They, it's just it was in it's a Nautilus, and they say basically that whenever you're in a state when you're like improvising they're talking about like jazz musicians improvising that the the part of your brain that is involved in intentional internally generated self-expression in the pursuit of goal and in oriented behaviors is going but then this other part of your brain that thinks about like social consequences and judgment and stuff like that the uh dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the lateral orbofrontal cortex, they're shut down. Uh, they're, they're like they're they're like turned down at least. And so they say, but as any skilled performer will tell you, inhibitions are the key enemy or the enemy of uh, improvisation. So like, I don't know. It's just kind of saying that. And then also like time expands too, like the um, the those those parts of your brain that are shut down, those um, the ones that are about uh, yeah about self consciousness and whatever. That's also the ones where you like keep track of time, and yeah, your your sense of time is all effed up. And they, so they talk about these things are also turned off in dreams and that's why like nonsense shit happens and like dreams can feel long or really long or really short. So pretty interesting. I do um, really like research about time dilation because it is so interesting that like, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, this day will never end. You know what I mean? Like everything is going so slow. And now mm-hmm. I feel like past week, was like you know the length of a single city block yeah true i mean it's it's insane like 
I there's this one I listen to the Voices of VR podcast about like just VR stuff and VR research and there's this one really um simple study where they made people just hang out on a VR island and they made the sun move across the sky at different speeds and they so they would control the length of these like virtual days and when the sun moved faster their experience of time was like they thought more time would pass and when they would make it go slower they felt like less time would pass so like just with like light <laughs> like these like these like simple ways you can completely um just like warp someone's sense of time pretty easily like you have control over warping someone else's sense of time it's true we have these like very simple dependencies like gravity you know if you don't have gravity your bones just turn into pretzels Mm -hmm. like (laughs) and another another study was just like anytime anybody's in any vr at least of what i've seen and i've tested this myself if you put them in for um a half hour and you say like how much time has passed when you take it off they always say 10 minutes it's insane oh weird well it'll loop this back to uh anime yes so if you got blasted into the universe and you were frozen (coughs) but you couldn't move at all and you're out of the solar system so you're not there's no specific sun that's moving. I guess the one thing that's moving are the stars, kind of. Mm-hmm. Would, would would your sense of time get like kind of crazy? Like maybe like a year would pass in a second for you, just, absolutely, just because the limited amount of stimulation. I oh, a, don't know. Yeah. That's I just read a whole one. book about that, time. Yeah, that's a nifty one, Paul. I would I would earmark that for some novel shit. Uh, I've got such a good idea. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about it, but I ha- I just read this book about time and like, just like about how, how it's actually, it doesn't exist. It's only in our heads and stuff. And like, it's basically like time doesn't exist. But um, I thought of like, you like, speaking of quantum shit, quantum entanglement, you know about that? Mm-hmm. Yes. Like how, like if I, you have like two particles and they're entangled, I could be like on the other side of the planet and affect one and it, the other one will instantly change. Imagine, like you said, Evan, that you have a quantum television, right? Um, LG makes the quantum television where there's one TV that is, has a camera and <laughs> on it. And then another TV where all the pixels on that TV are quantum entangled with the other one. Right. And then you have one person stay on Earth, and then you have another person go, like, down by a black hole, right? Like, right next to a black hole, so time starts going way slower for them. But you have this quantum-entangled TV screen. Would we start be playing would, – would, like, your, your view of the people back on Earth start looking like a time-lapse video? Like, they're playing back at, like, super high speed because you've got this quantum-entangled communicator? Wow. That's a brain twister. If I ever heard one. Huh. You know what I mean? That's my that's my experiment that I've got to try out. Maybe it's stupid. I really need a good uh, like a quantum scientist to like fact check that. <laughs> You're like LG. I need a really good. Well, I don't need LG. Maybe. I just need like quantum. a scientist to be like, what would happen? I guess the basic question is, if you have two quantum entangled particles, and yeah. you take them into um, very di- very distinctly different gravitations, gravity amounts like one really close to something really massive and one like way out in space or something would i don't know would they affect each other and how would they affect each other i love that okay so here's my anime pitch we ran this experiment basically this is in the aftermath right after the experiment there's this localized point in japan where time is slowing way down and it's fucking everything up and they have Mm -hmm. to send eight squad of teenagers for some reason in and they're the only ones that can stop this from happening Uh, that's interesting i mean the cool thing about i don't know but it'd be it'd be cool to like keep going (coughs) into the area and then coming back out and like oh shit a hundred years have passed yes oh hell yeah this is good it's like bit this is this is what the best basic analyst this is essentially the the equation that netflix original anime is running on they're like we're going to cook this idea down so basic, but it's going to be animated. So it's going to be pretty tight. And I'm like, you're right. It is pretty, tight. pretty good. Um, 
so yeah, I guess that article didn't hit as hard as I wanted it to, but <laughs> it is kind of cool that they're saying they're just talking about time dilation and stuff. I just wish I knew more because like I've experienced it uh, in so many different contexts. Like, um, you know, I used to play, I used to play lacrosse a lot and like the idea of the zone or whatever, like whatever that like athletic yeah. state is, is definitely something that I've experienced. It's just like, how can you ever possibly, how could you ever possibly demonstrate that? You know, how could you test that? Like you'd have to be wearing like a portable MRI machine, like while you were playing. I think that's what they did. I think that's, oh, I, I'm not sure if I actually, I don't know if that did that. I didn't read it in this article, but I swear to God, I've heard that there was an experiment where they made like um, jazz pianists and stuff like improvise while in an MRI machine. Oh, interesting. I see. Well, I mean, that is what most science mostly is. It's like backdooring your way into a concept like that. So that makes sense. Yeah. I thought you had to be like super still in an MRI. Yeah, yeah. They were locked up. I mean, it was probably tough to do it, but I swear I might have even seen this video. I have such a strong image of this happening. Um, do you want some more psychology news? This is a pretty, this is one from like two weeks ago, but it's still really relevant because it's world hashtag world cup fever. Wow. What, um, what a crossover. What a combo. Uh, yeah. Social bonding, key cause of football violence. So previous research has linked sports related hooliganism to social maladjustment. Example, previous episodes of violence or dysfunctional behavior at home, work, or school. However, social bonding and a desire to protect and defend other fans may be one of the main motivations, not only for football hooliganism, but extremist group behavior in general. So, yeah. I feel yeah. like that's pretty straightforward. I feel like we already knew that. It's sort of, yeah, yeah, I guess. But it's weird. They're saying previous research is linked to, like, the people who, like, act out after, like, your, your team wins or loses and, like, tips over police cards. They're like, oh, yeah, those are, like, the bad people just, like, finally getting a time to, like, lash out. But they're saying, no, these are normal, happy, not violent people that becoming. See someone getting, like, beat up and they're like, I'm about to join the fight. Yeah. They but, said that. Put the Smash Bros controller in my hand. Let's do this. Well, they said they they said there's it's this concept of identity fusion. You heard this concept? No, but I like it. Sounds it. cool, like right? It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the findings reinforce research teams' previous work to understand the role of identity fusion in extreme behavior. They suggest that fighting extreme behavior with extreme policing, such as the use of tear gas or military force, is likely to be counterproductive and will only trigger more violence, driving the most committed fans to step up and defend their fellow fans. As with all identity fusion driven behaviors, the violence comes from a positive diet desire to protect the group. Um, says the project director, Professor Harvey Whitehouse. Understanding this might help us tap into this social bonding and use it for good. For example, we already see groups of fans setting up food banks or crowdfunding pages for chronically ill fans they don't even know. So yeah, they're like it's like this thing where we just like fucking you get in a group and you just fuse with the group and you want to protect her. You just feel it's like this, this, that is kind of like the other side of the coin of like what it's, what it means to be a human, you know, just like it's super, all, super identifying like, with a group. Yeah. This would also explain like why it's possible to be like radicalized on an internet forum. You think it, it is. Well, yeah, I mean, if, yeah. if the basic concept here is is that like a group identity, even if it's like a weird, estranged sports group, uh, yeah. you know, if you see someone getting attacked, you're like, well, I need yeah, to do yeah. something about that. Yeah, true. Like even nonviolent groups on the internet, as soon as they yeah. become an enemy to anyone, people will step up and defend it. Yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember where I heard this. Like. There's something about how um, like military experiences, like people who've like fought in the trenches together, it's not just like remembering the terror of war and like that makes it important. It's like it is like a transcendent experience. Like like it's like um, it's like the most special moment in a lot of people's lives. Oh, uh, being that, at war. That, 
that fusion during war. Oh yeah, no, I've heard that. Um, I don't remember where I heard it recently either, but just that like I don't know if this is what you were talking about, but like they talk about the bond between like two of soldiers. Like this is such a tense environment, and you know that everybody has your back in a way that like is beyond any sort of like relationship in your life because it's so fucking extreme. And they said that whenever they get back from war and they're in regular day, everyday life, that that sense of like brothership or whatever brotherhood is gone. And that you sort of get like a bit depressed from that lack of that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I did. I I don't remember where I saw that recently, but I, I saw that. (laughs) Um. So let me see. I got a few more stories. There's this one about. No, I don't want that one. Hmm. I guess let me actually. Um, I don't want to pay for the Washington Post. <laughs> Can I just say that? Yeah. No. You know, I found a way around the paywalls. It's pretty easy. I just uh, well, you, you know, copy I the thought... the link and then put it in Instapaper, and somehow it doesn't recognize that. Oh yeah, 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 because the server's like scraping it. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh man, I saw, I found this article in Nature, and it was also paywalled. It was like pay forty dollars, and I was like, Ooh, no. <laughs> yeah, I I know that there's like a few people like poking around Twitter, being like, we need to like make all academic papers like publicly available, and it is a bummer. That's whenever true. I, I will have this topic that I'm like, you, you do you guys get that how rare it is for any human to be like interested in stuff this nerdy? Like you should be happy. I'm interested in reading your bullshit. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it it's, also, it's like, already like hard enough to get people to read it at all, but then you put, make me pay a large amount of money to see it. Well, you know, it's know. like, it just doesn't make like, sense. It's like enterprise. Basically they can get businesses to pay for it. So why not? But yeah. I also feel like, there's like got to be some way around it, like you know I'm what I mean. Sure there it's, is. It's Maybe not, I'm not hardcore not enough. No, I mean obviously there's ways around it. I'm saying like, can we get like a government grant or something to like, I don't know, give this fucking university forty thousand dollars or something? It's just annoying that there's like good information behind paywalls, yeah. and then the only information that isn't is lame. And, and often, it's not like that money is going to or towards research. Right. The money that will be going to the pay for these research papers? No, it's going to like the aggregator, like, you know. Yeah. Whatever those things are, like uh, LexisNexis or whatever. Hmm. I mean, I don't know who owns that, but still. I mean, not that I don't want to give them money, but I just feel like it's in science's interest to make it as easy as possible for people to read their shit. Because, like, seriously, some of it's dry as hell. That's a fact. Um, man, I really want to find this nature article. I just, oh, I'll never um, find it. Well, oh yeah, I'll read this article because this is cool. This is tech, tech, animal, and robot fusion. Whoa! There's a good video that goes with this too. It's actually on Futurity too. A lookout, Verge. Futurity's coming for you. Whoa! Heyo. <laughs> I don't know who. It, I don't know if they're good, but anyway, this is. Um, the title is. Rescue rover deals with rough terrain like a beaver. Uh, so they're, we're developing a system for autonomous robots to behave similarly. The robot continuously monitors and modifies its terrain to make it more mobile. So they're saying, like, the way that beavers build dams is they just look at this water moving and they're like, I got to make this not move. And then they just start doing the stick thing, start, start stacking them, and then eventually a dam is built. And it's like through these just simple reactions to the environment these simple rules that help it manipulate its environment you know what i mean uh so anyway there's this robot they they like had to get it from like on the ground up to this platform and so and then there's a bunch of rocks all around and so the robot looks at the environment and then just moves bean bags around to make it easier for it to climb up these rocks so they can climb up the rocks so this is like an algorithm that they're working on so that robots can modify their environment for instance in like rescue scenarios in case they need like move stuff to help them get around stuff you know what i mean i love that yeah so that's awesome i i haven't seen much i mean like uh, as far as i know like 
opening doors is still like a pretty important topic of research for robotics. So mm-hmm. like any modifying an environment dynamically. But the thing is, it's like, man, like you guys have played video games. Like video game physics are not um, perfect. No. <laughs> and so like you're going to have to, like this is going to have to judge how heavy things are. Yeah. And, and, and then like the physics the physics of moving stuff around. Like as soon as you think of the environment as non-static, you have to do a, a lot more calculations. Yeah. Well, and also what I will say though, is that like the, I think the thing that we often like lose track of is the fact that like animals are sort of like, even mammals are sort of like swarm mentality on a different time frame, you know? So like, it's hard for us to think because like robots are like a million dollars to make. But imagine if you just had 30,000 of them over time. You know what I mean? Like if they could just reproduce like animals do. Oh, you mean just like through generations learning? Yeah, just like just but I, I really what I really like about this uh, article is like I'm so about like strip strip mining algorithms from like <laughs> animal cognition. Like that is so dope. Yeah. Do you want to hear it? There's like a couple of sentences here that you guys would be very interested in. This is the reason why I had to read it because there's this new word, a new good new vocabulary word that I think you guys would both be interested in called stigmergy. Heard that word? Ooh, no. No. Stigmergy. Okay. So to address this issue, the issue of like needing to modify your environment and then learn from it, you know, um, he's studying stigmergy, a biological phenomenon that has been used to explain everything from the behavior of termites and beavers to the popularity of Wikipedia. According to stigmergy, the complex nests that termites build are not the result of a well-defined plan or deep communication. Instead, it's a type of indirect coordination. Initially, a termite will deposit a pheromone-laced ball of mud in a random spot. Other termites attracted to the pheromones are more likely to drop their mud balls at the same spot, and the behavior ultimately leads to a large termite nest. Researchers have compared this behavior to Wikipedia and other online collective projects. For example, one user creates a page in the online encyclopedia, another will modify it with additional information, and the process continues indefinitely with users building more complex pages. So yeah. So it's will, kinda like network effects. Yeah. Will humans be able to recreate my cognition through my garbage tweets? Um, are you just talking Westworld right now? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um No, I don't think so. No, I, are, you t- are, you talking, are you saying stigmergy is the way you get back to you? I think so. I mean, yeah. Well, there's so. so if you look at if you look at it backwards, like you know, like yes. Well, I mean, just like what is the physiology that like lets this happen? You know what I mean? Like maybe that's not important, but you know, if everybody's dropping their mud, I, listen on Twitter, we are all dropping our mud balls. Yeah, definitely. There's no difference. There's no difference between these two things. Yeah, and somebody drops like a really stinky mud ball. More yeah. people drop <laughs> drop their mud balls on that mud ball. Eventually, it's it's a viral tweet. <laughs> but 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 on twitter yeah people are like putting their mud balls next to other mud balls but it's not creating an elaborate like structurally sound we don't know what um, the, st- the structure is sort of invisible that's the weird thing the structure that the anything for that termites and, and ant colonies and bees and stuff those aren't invisible yeah i know but that's, that's what's cool about digital. Are those yeah. stigmergy or are bees stigmergy or do they have a different method? No, that's that's it. Stigmergy is it's the same thing. That's what they're saying. I don't think it has to be a physical um structure. It's it's more of a compounding structure. It's like a added that's added it's it's one it's, like you remember we talking about katamari? <laughs> last week yeah. yeah yeah it's kind of like katamari you start with the one thing and but, then stig- it's just like everything is like grow it's like a fractal you know okay but like so let's go back to beavers right if i i um i put a stick somewhere i'm like oh yeah this is place good place to put a stick mm-hmm. and then another beaver comes along like well you already put a stick there i'll put a stick next to it mm-hmm. it's kind of important how that second beaver places its its stick it, yeah. Whether or not it's going to build towards the dam or just be a random pile of well, sticks. See, you could put a, a random pile of sticks in a river and that's not a dam. 
Weren't they saying though that the the stigmergy in this case was the force of them running water? And so like, oh, I gotta stop this. Like I'm well, my body they were just using that as an time. example of like the running stopping the running water was the goal, and then it does all this shit to get to that goal. I mean, listen, if somebody's on the other side of my wall and they're just like tapping on my wall with a hammer, I want to go, uh, my behavior modifies and I want to go to the other side and be like, fucking, what are you doing? Wait, what? But <laughs> I would say there's a, there's in this case, like there's a stimulus, like an initial stimulus. And then there is a natural behavioral reaction to that stimulus that like, apparently it sounds like that these scientists have like started to zero in on. Yeah, I don't think that in this article they talked about, you know, the nitty gritty of like what is in the algorithm. They just introduced the basic concept of compounding complexity. Um, but it's, it's, it's like, like with Wikipedia, you're building towards an actual uh, share, like a shared goal. Kind of. Sort it's of, interesting. Yeah. Like the, yeah, it's interesting like the, in Wikipedia. This is the method of, this is the method of coordination for that shared goal. Which is non, like hierarchical, but it's still, um, it still is a shared goal. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm just, uh, I'm still, I want to see the structure of the. What is it called? Stig, stigma. What is it? I mean, there's a lot of stigmergy. I mean, look at stigma. a termite nest. That's the structure. Well, that's what I'm saying. I just want to know what the stigmergy of of Twitter is. I want to see what our collective balls well, uh, are accumulating to. I think it's hard to see exactly what it would be. I would argue like the, you know how like every once in a while those network maps of the internet pop up of like connections. I imagine it's that. I don't know though. I I mean, obviously I've just learned this term, so I have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. But my, what I'm conjecturing is like the, if, if, if I said like, Hey, let's tell a story. I'll say the first sentence. You say the second sentence. Like, and then you have like, like the, the seventh person in the chain says poop but you know <laughs> like they are contravening the purpose of the stigmergy yes you know they're like breaking it and that's why i feel like something like twitter oh, is all all people breaking combo breaking so maybe so, yeah. yeah combo breakers all over the place so yeah you yeah. can have some people stig stigmerger stigmergering um another if you just google the word stigmergy one of the most popular image searches they show like a school of fish and like a bunch of ants but the most popular is um those when birds fly in those huge clusters you know that look like mm -hmm. crazy uh, swarms yeah. and that's like yeah they're always talking about how stigmergy always comes down to like a, a couple simple rules and i feel like paul and i have talked about this before where like you, this, this simple rule for birds in in like those swarm clusters is just do what your neighbors are doing just like follow their rules and so that that's how they get these like really complex swarms and it's like sort of random. So I guess those guys that would be always throwing combos are like whenever you see those, like if you just watch those, you know, like the sudden, the sudden swells, the sudden like ripples where they just change direction. I guess those are the fucking Mavericks uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> shit posting or something. I don't know. <laughs> the leader, the leader of the flock of ducks is just a shit poster. And everyone's yeah, so, possibly. Everyone's possibly. RTing so hard. Or, or, or <laughs> the, the, the variance happens because of like wind or environment, right? Yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe it's not a Maverick. Someone just gets knocked off yeah. course. And or a volcano. Like, Let's go with a it. A volcano explodes, <laughs> you know? A volcano explodes. Everybody's talking about that. That's like literally – that's something. Well, I like – so true. There is a flocking behavior on Twitter as far as like what our attention is on. The, I like what I like sort of like I guess the thing with the beavers that I was like really interested in is like the impulse. You know what I mean? Like we've definitely talked about on past podcasts. Just the beavers like, hate running water. It's just like something about it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Like, why does a dog make that little fucking nest rotation? You yeah, know, yeah. There. True. Well, yeah. I mean. It's because it's like vital. It's like it's just one of those hardwired tendencies. That's what I'm saying. It's like these yeah, beavers are like, God, I gotta fucking stop this water. What? Okay. What? What if a be a beaver is is separated from its parents at birth, 
it will it have that have, same instinct. I think that instinct for a beaver is so natural. I've got to imagine it doesn't like have to literally to have how, how to literally build hardwired. I mean, that's pretty bonkers. I, mean, I don't if you know. Think about I'd it, have like, to Google it, but if, maybe not. If I was going to try to write a, a computer program, right? Like we're we're you know we got one beaver sperm and one beaver egg, and there's enough information somehow in there. Like I'm not saying that there isn't. I'm just like that. This this is this baby beaver is gonna grow up to really want to stop water. Yeah, <laughs> like that yeah. is a very complex. I mean, not like obviously, you know, it's not like Declaration of Independence level of intellect, but it's right. still like it is. It's a real, it's a real thought, you know, that leads to action. I mean, that's pretty, it's pretty astounding to me. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm being, my mind is being tainted by Westworld, which is, like, focusing on be like, I mean, the, the, I guess the point of this season was, like, do humans really have free will? Blah, I, I don't think they, they sort of don't. Let's, let's. Man, I heard a really good proof for why they do the other day, but I forgot what it oh, was. Oh, shit, I would, oh, damn it. It was a slam dunk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! You know, you know what? You know what podcast we should do? We should do sure. we should do a uh, podcast that's just like really good GitHub's that we found this week. Ooh! Do you really have that many? For sure. I mean, I'd love to. You know what? I like that. I'd like that podcast if it started off with like, how do I even use that information from GitHub? <laughs> totally. Um. So. Have you heard, have you heard of Docker? <laughs> No. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, maybe someday you can explain Docker to me because I feel like I'm on this. I'm on tier two, and you might be on like tier seven. I wrote a I wrote a, like a tier one, explain Docker post, for the Verge. I read it. I read the, it. Good. Oh. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I read that, and I'm a tier two. <laughs> okay. Okay. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Yeah, I could probably explain it a bit more. But yeah, we'll save it for the for the Git GitHub. What's a good name for the GitHub podcast? Get, the, oh man, I don't know. Ooh, there's mm. there's so many like little programmer names you could have it. My the first instinct is just the Git cast. I don't know why. I, the the repo man taken. The repo man. The Git cast. That's probably already taken by GitHub. Probably. If it's not, then that's dumb. Um, do you think we should end yeah. this show or do you want ooh, to hear that thing ooh, about surveillance ooh. cameras? Paul, what do you got? What? Get G E T get. Get get. Pretty good. <laughs> I like it. Maybe oh, you know that gamer phrase get good? Maybe it could be get good. Get get. Get get. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry for completely derailing your podcast. Run yeah, so just apologize to the fans. They're the ones who are just waiting for science. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. Sorry, audience. Sorry for <laughs> life here. I know you you got the science Jones. So right. let's we're yeah, gonna okay. we're gonna close up the cast. Um I'm gonna skip the thing about su- the surveillance camera thing. Whatever. It's a pretty cool I I'll send you the message, but like it's kinda hard to explain, so I just abandoned it. Yeah, let's follow up on it. Um Okay, so that's the cast. What was your guys' favorite story? Looking back on it, the volcano story where no one died. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, it's on the Galapagos, so it'll fuck up the probably, environment. But it, it's probably it, beautiful. It, this one's doing it all the time, so it's not a huge deal. Yeah, I seriously can't remember what the topics. <laughs> were. Well, we talked about dirty space. The the Dirty Space of, is pretty good. The uh, loose flamingo, Ooh, that was organic hard molecules, um, catch it, getting fish from the deep ocean. Yeah, the moon one was good. Social bonding, key cause of football violence. What time feels like when you're improvising? I guess the fugitive flamingo is my fave. <laughs> After all, so so strong. <laughs> Okay, thanks for listening. Thanks for being on the show. Are we going in so, um, Stitchcast? I did nothing sewing related this week. Well, I'm um, saying, like, are we going to do it, like, I don't know, sometime soon, Stitchcast? 
I'm probably going to order my, my sewing machine, like probably in the next few days. I just, there's so many different kinds or that's not right. Yeah. There's a few different kinds and it's just hard to know which ones are the one you want, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, maybe once you once you feel confident on what you're gonna buy, maybe that's a good opening episode. Good, good point. That's a good yeah. call. Um, yeah. If you guys didn't know, we did a podcast last week, and at the end, we decided we were gonna do a Stitch Cast where we talk about sewing and other stuff and embroidery. Yeah, I want I want to offer a correction to anybody who listened to that. I said that the sewing machine was like sort of like the birth of the computer but it was the loom which is like you know mm-hmm. kind of a like side step from the sewing machine but still the um but the, 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 the jacquard loom is the specific one it's like it's the one with like the punch cards that made like lots of different patterns yeah Ooh. i don't know what sufi was staying, singing about i'm not sure <laughs> uh okay ah, nice. thanks, cool. for, thanks for listening uh write us write us in at the show if you want us to talk about certain topics or if you have a story you want to hear about nice <laughs> should i put on the theme song again yes um i lost it hold on <laughs> <laughs> science 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 I mean, I don't have my own yet. I'll I'll work on getting my own. It's Science Thursday. Science, science. Science, 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 science. Science Thursday. Nailed it. It's a Science Thursday. Okay. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. We're...